limit what they can do together with the child that changes their interactions. It means when a special pet has to be euthanized or an accident has occurred and someone is hospitalized. There are a whole range of losses that your child may experience and need support for during their childhood, and some of them may be very painful for you too. Again, I repeat, we have found that people do better when they actually have the conversation than when they imagine having them. When you talk with your child, you are also talking with yourself on some level. When you tell your child about an illness or a death, you are also reinforming yourself of something that may be painful for you too. The child's response may help you see more clearly what you are actually dealing with. Observing your child's reaction and having it mingle with your own can be a powerful experience for you. People often tell us they are unsure they will be emotionally strong enough to manage their child's emotions. Of course, it can be difficult to tolerate someone else's feelings when you are struggling to manage your own. Some people have told us that they feel as if they are burdening their child by sharing information or they are stripping their child of childhood innocence. They rationalize their own reluctance to talk openly and honestly by telling themselves it will deny the child the belief that everything is okay, nothing truly bad ever happens, and that their parents can protect them from anything hurtful. Of course, bad things do happen, and parents cannot keep the reality of the world away from their children completely, nor should they. But sometimes this is hard. This is a hard fact for even parents to accept. Know that resilience and strength only develop by facing challenges, and children can sense the truth when their parents are upset, even when their parents are managing their own feelings well. They can sense the truth when their parents are withholding pertinent information. And it is more important for children to feel that they can trust their parents to be honest with them than to hide things from them that of course will come to light sooner or later. What's interesting is that a child is constantly reading you, especially at moments of intense emotion, which this clearly is. Their security comes from knowing that you will tell the truth, that you will try to answer their questions and by recognizing what you do and not just what you say. They will be very, very attuned to you since your follow through and consistency is what helps to settle them. Nonetheless, some matters can be so upsetting that they are hard for everyone to address. Elena, please talk about why in spite of all this, it is still better to bring these issues up for conversation than hide them away. So death is an inevitable part of life. Therefore, talking about death is an inevitable part of caretaking children. I'm gonna offer you several reasons that we believe that it is not only inevitable, it is actually a beneficial opportunity. So first, if you are the one to bring upsetting news or to raise hard issues, you get to determine the narrative. You can decide how it is said and what message is conveyed, factually as well as emotionally, rather than their teenage cousin or Facebook, for example. Things get communicated by our actions, not just our words, and you as an adult who loves them can be mindful of that as you talk with your child. The internet doesn't do that. And very importantly, you can be with them right there as they absorb it to help them process it. You can then hold space for them to grasp a new painful reality as you are available to sort out their reactions, offer comfort and answer questions. And out of this comes trusting you that you are steady and sturdy, ready to face even the hard stuff with them and that you believe in them, that they will be able to cope and make it through. Your belief in your child leads to your child believing in themselves that they can indeed get through challenges with you at their side and then on their own. Therefore, they can feel hope facing the future. And in the case of a loss, hopeful even without that special someone who died. I'm sure you've heard the phrase moving on, referring to what people do after someone dies. Well, we don't believe in moving on. That is not what we humans do with our attachments. 
we frame it as moving forward with, as a hard new reality shapes the future of you and your child and becomes woven into your story. When I was facing that worst time in my life when I started leukemia, my now 97 year old mother-in-law who I adore said to me, pain shared is pain halved. I've learned time and again in my personal life and in my work how right she was. Talking about it together, you can teach your child that together we can bear even the unbearable and that they do not have to carry their suffering alone. Instinctively, you might be concerned you're hurting your child, causing them to suffer emotionally if you talk about death. Most children from their day-to-day -day life have a sense of what death is. They witness it in movies, on TV, and on the internet with news of deaths due to COVID, war, natural disasters, mass shootings, and more. Perhaps even before loss within your child's personal world. On any given day, besides all that, they may see in nature red or yellowing leaves now fallen, a dead worm or fly, an injured or obviously ill person on the street. So if you are willing to talk openly with your child about illness and death, you are being there to help them understand it, not leaving them alone with all that. And if someone is terminally ill, by which we mean death is expected in less than three months, we recommend that you do indeed tell your child that the someone in their world will not live long and is going to die. This allows you and your child to live in the same reality connected to each other. So we can certainly imagine you thinking, why? They're gonna get sad enough when the person dies, why do they need to know in advance? However, once you have had to take in such sad news, you are emotionally altered and your children can sense that intuitively even via subtle changes in your nonverbal behavior, although you may make great effort to put on a brave face. In addition, if your child knows that someone they care about does not have long to live, they can plan with you ways to make the most of their remaining time with them as best as is possible. They get the chance to say goodbye, even give parting gifts, to make amends, and to make more memories by being aweardly with them in their final weeks. Your child then has more of the person in their heart and memories after that person dies. It gives a gift to the dying person as well, the ability to be with people they care about honestly and openly in their final days and for them to say their own goodbyes with love. It also gives you the opportunity to help your child be more emotionally prepared when the death occurs, not so taken by surprise. So having asked you to consider having such difficult conversations open-heartedly with a child, we have some guidance about how to do so. Michael, what makes such a conversation possible? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how we think you might take care of yourself and your child you know, within, within the conversation, but also in preparing yourself to, to have that conversation. So it is clear, it, it is important to clear yourself emotionally before you begin with your child. Showing emotion is a good thing, but it can't be unbridled or an overwhelming display. You wanna to try to be in control of the emotion you feel as you explain and model for your child how you will handle and manage yourself in light of and in spite of the news. It's why we advise you to think about your own feelings first before you make the conversation. What might it bring to mind for you? When you have thought about, when, when, when have you thought about this before? Can you remember how you were told something similar when you were growing up? Go over the matter in your own mind and if possible with your partner or a trusted friend. Have a good cry if that's coming up. Save the big tears if you can for when you are away from your child, but by all means, bring your under control feelings with you. Your children need to see you reacting in your managed emotional way, so they have a model for how to carry and convey their own feelings. You just don't want to overwhelm or scare them with your loss of control, and you certainly don't want to leave them with the feeling that they need to take care of you. And since this is a give and take conversation, Prepare yourself by thinking about who your child is, 
and how they handle their emotions about how they have taken in hard news before. Do they like simple, straight, direct information or a lot of slow buildup? Do they want alone time or a cuddle? Do they pepper you with questions or grow quiet and introspective? Taking the time to anticipate how your child tends to react to challenging situations and how he may be best helped through the experience is a vital part of the process. Having cleared yourself emotionally, try to focus in on their feelings and keep in mind that your child is reading you emotionally as you tell them and read them. So say what you believe and not simply what you think they want to hear. So having offered you how to prepare to have difficult conversations, how do you actually do it? It facilitates the conversation if you can plan for where, when, and how. This is of course not always possible, but if it is, here's what we would recommend. Have the conversation as a family, telling siblings together, even if they are very different ages. The older child can have a more extended conversation with you later that day. Have all screens, as they call them, off, phones on vibrate and out of the way, ideally not near bedtime as it is much harder for a child to face the nighttime separation after they've heard some upsetting news. Allow for time after telling the information for your family to be together for a bit and have in mind the potential activity for after that everyone could partake in after questions have been asked and your children seem ready to stop talking for now. For example, pizza for lunch or a walk. We would suggest beginning with some general statement. We have some sad news to tell you. And then a simple statement of what has occurred. Aunt Jane died this morning in a car accident. And then let your child know you'll be there with them. Let's spend some time together. And then a brief pause to see how everyone is. You should ask, do you have any questions? And we suggest you convey that they can ask questions now and any time they have any after that. Brief silences, a minute or so, depending on the age of your child, can feel awkward, but they allow your child some space to think about what they heard, see if they understand it or have questions, and to express emotions as you stay there receptive and attentive. Another guideline that we offer that how to actually have these conversations is to tell the truth, nothing but the truth, but not necessarily the whole truth at least not all at once. We encourage you not to keep secrets from your child, even about hard truths, and to answer their questions as directly as you can, tailored to their age. Almost invariably, children find out the truth, so best it be you who tells them. I found personally, as well as in my work, that people young and old do much better when they hold the truth together, even those unbearable truths, than when left to wonder and fill in the unknowns with their own imaginings and have to do so alone. So let's give you a hypothetical example, like one of the questions that Michael offered. An eight-year-old child learns that a beloved uncle has died. And then after sitting quietly for minutes says, are you gonna die too, mommy? Now, that is a deer in the headlights moment, potentially. We all have them with children and how marvelous that that is so, our children challenge us and teach us about themselves, about ourselves and about the world. So what could you say that can offer comfort given our recommendation that you be honest? One possible reply goes something like this. I take the best care of my health and safety that I can and I plan to keep doing that. I plan to live a long time. Some children will be made quite at ease by that. However, however, other children might not find that enough and could present you with a follow-up. But will you die? One day I will die. It's part of nature. And when I do, you will be older and you will be ready and you will not be alone. So we can go into that more in the question and answer and talk time if anybody wants to. This is not one conversation, it's a process. Many conversations starting then and evolving over time within the next hours, days, weeks, and also even years after, as your child develops and rethinks earlier events and wants to understand them in more mature ways. Then you can fill in more detail or more depth 
on what occurs. And because it's a process, you don't have to get it right in any one conversation. If you don't feel something came out correctly, or you told a falsehood, or left out crucial information because you were overcome or uncomfortable, you can always go back and say to your child something like this. I was thinking over our conversation about Aunt Jane dying. I didn't say some of the information the way I wish I had. And then you can reframe it. This teaches your child that they too do not have to always get it right the first time, that all people can say things not the way they wished, and that is okay because you can revisit it. So one of the main things that we have found is that it just doesn't go according to a script. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about, uh, you know, what we call expect the unexpected. Um, keep in mind that every child is unique. Your child will react in his own way, and it might not be the way you react or expect him to react. Leave your child room to take in the news and respond as he will over time. There is no one way you need to teach your child, though he might ask you how to handle certain things. Best to ask him what he thinks. Let him do it his, let him do it his way. You may be surprised to find a child feeling somehow responsible for a particular death in an effort to answer for themselves the why. If only I had been more polite, cleaned up my room better, did this or didn't do that, as though they had done something to make this happen. Childhood logic isn't the same as ours, and they try to puzzle something out for themselves. You can respond to this in a straightforward way. This had nothing to do with what you said to grandma on your visit. Her sickness was just too strong and the doctors tried everything they could, but they couldn't fix it anymore. Think empathically, considering your child's needs above your own and thinking through what he needs from you in responding to his loss. You may come to realize that you had a conversation flow in your mind and it goes very differently. Taking the lead from your child is best. It lets you relate to how he is feeling and what he is saying instead of what you had preconceived. Be open to any reactions your child might have. It can be helpful to acknowledge that some of this process is beyond your control. That way you can prepare yourself for how to stay with your child emotionally when he surprises you. Even with the best preparation, every parent can face times when they don't know what to do in both happy and sad situations. It is part of the package for caring for children. No matter what your child's reaction is, anticipated or not, it is useful to remind yourself to try to stay calm. No matter what your child's reaction is, anticipated or not, it is useful to remind yourself to try to stay calm patient and compassionate. If you feel yourself becoming overwrought or angry, take some time to catch your breath. It will help you and your child. Remember this is conversations, plural. If you have to stop because you are upset, that's fine. If you have to take a break because your child indicates he's had enough for now, that's okay too. If you need to pause because you can't think how to answer, it's okay to say, let me think about that for a while. If you think you haven't answered a question well or fully enough, you can go back to it for another attempt. The main idea is to begin a series of conversations that form a foundation for talking about all sorts of difficult things that may arise now and in the future for your child in his life. So, Life brings us 10,000 joys and 10,000 sorrows. We wanna help you to be deeply connected to the children in your care through all the ups and downs. That is often easier with those ups and those downs because we hate to see our children suffer. Our wish is to make it all better, perhaps by giving false reassurances or rushing into quiet a difficult feeling, but just sitting with it together and letting the reality be what it is. In other words, bearing witness gives immense comfort and support and ultimately that does make it better. 
Though you cannot change that there are such harsh realities in life, you can change how your children are impacted by them. So that's the end of our prepared remarks. Um, and they were very structured on purpose. Um, but with our remaining time, we'd like to open it up for questions, comments, and discussion. And we really love the back and forth. So um, please don't be shy. If you have any thoughts, we welcome them. Does anybody have any any little story that they might want to share? Any example of anything that you've tried to get into? Does anybody have anything that they remember in how they were brought up to think about these kind of things? Well, while you guys are thinking about that, I see a question in the chat, and I'm going to read it aloud. Um, and apparently we're all, you all are muted. So I wonder if our host could unmute everybody. So if you wanna talk, you can just talk. Um, so here's the question. I understand why you suggest controlling your emotions when having the conversation with your child or children. It occurs to me that children see us as the rock in their otherwise complicated emotional world. Is this an opportunity to show some susceptibility to a parent's emotional fragility? Well, first of all, what I love about that question is how it's framed as an opportunity because many of us think that uh, showing emotional fragility as a parent is not a good thing. But what we believe, if you don't show emotional fragility at any time, your children never get to learn from your modeling. How do you handle difficult emotions? How do you express them? Um, and wouldn't it be odd if, for example, someone close to you all died and you as a parent never cried in front of them? To me, it feels natural that they see you cry, but they see you showing emotion in a way that is measured. If you feel like you're going to have uncontrolled emotion, that's the kind of fragility we suggest you take outside of the relationship with the child and find your own other resources to support you. Michael, do you want to add anything? Yeah, yeah. I especially, I appreciate the person who's asking the question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> the, uh, the, um, you know, the thing is, is that you really are in showing your emotion, making it all right for your child to also show their emotion and to have something to get, you know, cuddly with. Um, I think, you know, in, in our conversations and Elena and I have really talked about, you know, the value of those kinds of shared emotions um, and the empathy that it creates between everybody. Um, in my comment, I was also suggesting that you want to measure it because you certainly don't want your child to end up feeling like they have to take care of you, which I, I know happens. I mean, it happens. And so, you know, it happens. Um, but um, yeah, I think, it's a, I think it's a very important uh, feature in, in, you know, in, the, in the evolving relationship with a child. And as usual, Michael and I get into back and forth. We can talk for hours, we have discovered. Um, so I'll add in something else. Your child sees you emotional, but they also get a chance to see you recoup. So that's a really important lesson. You can get emotional, you can be fragile, and then they see you pull yourself together. Ah, okay, they're adults, but even if they seem a little bit uncertain and unfra unfragile and vulnerable, they will come back together and be steady and sturdy for me again. And I think just seeing the evolution of that teaches your children that they too will be able to be emotional and then pull back together. This is um, similarly, if parents are fighting, let's say they're having a 
not a big fight and not frequent fights, but a, a small kind of fight. And do you show that in front of the children? And I think we would say, yeah, because you then show how you make up. And that's important. Parents get to, and children get to see that, yeah, things are tough and you get through them together and then you come to the other side. So any other brave souls wanna let us know of a question, a comment? Was any of this helpful? Was it all things that you object to or agree with? I think it was very, very good. I don't know if you can hear me or not, but it was can. Good. And we like what you're saying, so it's great. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was excellent, I thought. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, so we are coming to, oh, did, did somebody want to say something? No, it's me. Go ahead. I was just going to um, thank oh, okay. everybody. But go ahead. Yeah, if you want to have some parting before I do, maybe you want to have some parting comments. No, no. I just wanted to say thank you. Um, it's just this is something that I will remember. It's uh, it's a hallmark, and thank you very very much for joining us. Thank you. I do see a question in there about when does the book come out. <laughs> I think Jen is feeding us the questions he knows we want to hear. Yes, that's Thank a good you, question. <laughs> so um, we've each had a book come out before this. Michael's was called The Anxious Parent, and mine was called I Will Remember You. It's a guidebook um, through grief for teens. And the process, process was very, very different. This time around, what we're learning is that these things start way in advance. So we started writing this book before COVID back in uh -huh. about November of the year, let's see, what was that? What was that? And uh, when did COVID begin? Around March of 2020. And we handed it in to the copy editor just a week or two weeks ago. And we will get it back in a few weeks and then it will be published in August, August of 2022. So we're not exactly sure what they do between October right. and August. But there's a lot that goes on in terms of formulating the book and so on. We're going to be talking more about it as in the months that lead up to it. Great. Well, hopefully we'll hear there's, more about the book yeah. than from you. Go ahead, Meg. You had a question. Oh, if there, yeah, if there's time, it's not. A, it's not really a question. It's more of a comment. But I think that perhaps kind of the silence and and people not not asking too many questions is partially because most of us haven't fortunately had to go through a very close and and like sudden death let's say or something that's where our kids have been very young so but what I think was so valuable about this is because I think the thought process and the methodology that you guys were talking about is applicable to a whole range of subjects and it doesn't have to just be you know a, a death in the family although I think that's when people are the most um you know, at, at, at sea when this happens. But I think this could be helpful for a lot of us on a lot of, on a lot of topics, just the idea of the being open and, and sharing, knowing when, how much to share and, 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 uh, and addressing things very directly. So I think all of those things are, are, are takeaways that I'm going to take with me. So and that was good. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you. much. Absolutely. Thank you. Mary. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, Michael. in, in the book, we have a chapter on dealing with death in the media. So mm -hmm. a lot of these children are, and even older children are exposed to things like, as we were saying, COVID and so on. So you may find that even if in your personal world, you haven't had a loss, your children are dealing with losses and they're hearing about them at school and they're looking at them on the internet. So I think we believe that the same principles would apply for those kinds of conversations as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So Michael and Elena, thank you very much. And everybody, thank you for joining. Hopefully you can join at the next um, TED Talk in a few minutes, but thank you very much. And uh, we'll close it out. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Welcome. Thank you guys. Thank you. It's great to see you all. Thanks thank very you. much.